questionable proceedings. Having been away from home nearly a year, and having occasionally heard of my mother's poor health, I determined to make her a visit. So procuring a pass over the road, I went to Leavenworth, arriving there about June 1st, 1861, going from there home. The Civil War had broken out, and excitement ran high in that part of the country. My mother, of course, was a strong Union woman, and had such great confidence in the government that she believed the war would not last over six months. Leavenworth at that time was quite an important outfitting post for the West and Southwest, and the fort there was garrisoned by a large number of troops. While in the city one day, I met several of the old as well as the young men who had been members of the Free State Party all through the Kansas Troubles, and who had, like our family, lost everything at the hands of the Missourians. They now thought a good opportunity offered to retaliate and get even with their persecutors, as they were all considered to be secessionists. That they were all secessionists, however, was not true, as all of them did not sympathize with the South. But the Free State men, myself among them, took it for granted that as Missouri was a slave state, the inhabitants must all be secessionists, and therefore our enemy. A man by the name of Chandler proposed that we organize an independent company for the purpose of invading Missouri and making war on its people on our own responsibility. He at once went about it in a very quiet way and succeeded in inducing twenty-five men to join him in the hazardous enterprise having a longing and revengeful desire to retaliate upon the Missourians for the brutal manner in which they had treated and robbed my family. I became a member of Chandler's company. His plan was that we should leave our homes and parties of not more than two or three together and meet at a certain point near Westport, Missouri, on a fixed day. His instructions were carried out to the letter, and we met at the rendezvous at the appointed time. Chandler had been there some days before us, and thoroughly disguised, had been looking around the country for the whereabouts of all the best horses. He directed us to secretly visit certain farms and collect all the horses possible and bring them together the next night. This we did, and upon reassembling it, was found that nearly every man had two horses. We immediately struck out for the Kansas line which we crossed at the Indian Ferry on the Kansas River, above Wyandotte. And as soon as we had set foot upon Kansas soil, we separated with the understanding that we were to meet one week from that day at Leavenworth. Some of the parties boldly took their confiscated horses into Leavenworth, while others rode them to their homes. This action may look to the reader like horse-stealing, and some people might not hesitate to call it by that name but Chandler plausibly maintained that we were only getting back our own or the equivalent from the Missourians, and as the government was waging war against the South, it was perfectly square and honest, and we had a good right to do it. So we didn't let our consciences trouble us very much. We continued to make similar raids upon the Missourians off and on during the summer, and occasionally we had run and fights with them. None of the skirmishes, however, amounting to much. The government officials, hearing of our operations, put detectives upon our track, and several of the party were arrested. My mother, upon learning that I was engaged in this business, told me it was neither honorable nor right, and she would not for a moment countenance any such proceedings. Consequently, I abandoned the Jayhawken enterprise, for such it really was. About this time, the government bought from Jones and Cartwright several ox trains, which were sent to Raleigh, Missouri, all being put in charge of my old and gallant friend, Wild Bill, who had just become the hero of the day on account of a terrible fight which he had with a gang of desperados and outlaws, who infested the border under the leadership of the then-notorious Jake McCandless. In this fight, he had killed McCandless and three of his men. The affair occurred 
while Wild Bill was riding the Pony Express in western Kansas. The custom with the express riders, when within half a mile of a station, was either to begin shouting or blowing a horn in order to notify the stock tender of his approach, and to have a fresh horse already saddled for him on his arrival, so that he could go right on without a moment's delay. One day, as Wild Bill neared Rock Creek Station, where he was to change horses, he began shouting as usual at the proper distance. But the stock tender, who had been married only a short time, and his wife, living with him at the station, did not make his accustomed appearance. Wild Bill galloped up, and instead of finding the stock tender ready for him with a fresh horse, he discovered him lying across the stable floor with the blood oozing from a bullet hole in his head. The man was dead, and it was evident that he had been killed only a few moments before. In a second, Wild Bill jumped from his horse, and looking in the direction of the house, he saw a man coming towards him. The approaching man fired on him at once, but missed his aim. Quick as lightning, Wild Bill pulled his revolver and returned the fire. The stranger fell dead, shot through the brain. Bill, Bill, help! Help! Save me! Such was the cry that Bill now heard. It was the shrill and pitiful voice of the dead stock tender's wife, and it came from a window of the house. She had heard the exchange of shots and knew that Wild Bill had arrived. He dashed over the dead body of the villain whom he had killed, and just as he sprang into the door of the house, he saw two powerful men assaulting the woman. One of the desperados was in the act of striking her with the butt end of a revolver, and while his arm was raised, Bill sent a ball crashing through his skull, killing him instantly. Two other men now came rushing from an adjoining room, and Bill, seeing that the odds were three to one against him, jumped into a corner, and then firing, he killed another of the villains. Before he could shoot again, the remaining two men closed in upon him, one of whom had drawn a large bowie knife. Bill wrenched the knife from his grasp and drove it through the heart of the outlaw. The fifth and last man now grabbed Bill by the throat and held him at arm's length. But it was only for a moment, as Bill raised his own powerful right arm and struck his antagonist's left arm such a terrible blow that he broke it. The disabled desperado, seeing that he was no longer a match for Bill, jumped through the door, and mounting a horse, he succeeded in making his escape, being the sole survivor of the Jake McCandless gang. Wild Bill remained at the station with the terrified woman until the stage came along, and then consigned her to the care of the driver. Mounting his horse, he at once galloped off, and soon disappeared in the distance, making up for lost time. This was the exploit that was on everybody's tongue and in every newspaper. It was one of the most remarkable and desperate hand-to-hand -hand encounters that has ever taken place on the border. I happened to meet Wild Bill at Leavenworth as he was about to depart for Rolla. He wished me to take charge of the government trains as a sort of assistant under him, and I gladly accepted the offer. Arriving at Rolla, we loaded the trains with freight and took them to Springfield, Missouri. On our return to Rolla, we had heard a great deal of talk about the approaching fall races at St. Louis, and Wild Bill, having brought a fast-running horse from the mountains, determined to take him to that city and match him against some of the high flyers there. And down to St. Louis we went with this running horse, placing our hopes very high on him. Wild Bill had no difficulty in making up a race for him, all the money that he and I had we put up on the mountain runner. And as we thought we had a sure thing, we also bet the horse against two hundred and fifty dollars. I rode the horse myself, but nevertheless our sure thing, like many another sure thing, proved a total failure. And we came out of that race minus the horse and every dollar we had in the world. Before the race, it had been make or break with us and we got broke. We were busted in the largest city we had ever been in, and it is no exaggeration to say that we felt mighty blue.
On the morning after the race, we went to the military headquarters, where Bill succeeded in securing an engagement for himself as a government scout. But I, being so young, failed in obtaining similar employment. While Bill, however, raised some money by borrowing it from a friend, and then buying me a steamboat ticket, he sent me back to Leavenworth while he went to Springfield, which place he made his headquarters while scouting in southeastern Missouri. One night, after he had returned from a scouting expedition, he took a hand in a game of poker, and in the course of the game, he became involved in a quarrel with Dave Tut, a professional gambler, about a watch which he had won from Tut, who would not give it up. Bill told him he had won it fairly, and that he proposed to have it. Furthermore, he declared his intention of carrying the watch across the street next morning to military headquarters, at which place he had to report at nine o'clock. Tut replied that he himself would carry the watch across the street at nine o'clock, and no other man would do it. Bill then said to Tut that if he attempted anything of the kind, he would kill him. A challenge to a duel had virtually been given and accepted, and everybody knew that the two men meant business. At nine o'clock the next morning, Tut started to cross the street, while Bill, who was standing on the opposite side, told him to stop. At that moment, Tut, who was carrying his revolver in his hand, fired at Bill, but missed him. Bill quickly pulled out his revolver and returned the fire, hitting Tut squarely in the forehead and killing him instantly. Quite a number of Tut's friends were standing in the vicinity, having assembled to witness the duel. And Bill, as soon as Tut fell to the ground, turned to them and asked if any one of them wanted to take it up for Tut. If so, he would accommodate any of them then and there. But none of them cared to stand in front of Wild Bill to be shot at by him. Nothing, of course, was ever done to Bill for the killing of Tut. Well, that's about it for now. I hope my tales have brought at least a little liveliness into your hearts. I got to go now, but don't worry too much about me. I am sure to be back. Yours truly, Buffalo Bill Cody. We hope you enjoyed this interesting audio title. For more information on all of our titles, please visit us at thoughtaudio.com.